Good evening and welcome to the sixth meeting of Troy City Council. I'm Marty Baker, President of Council. Please silence your electronic devices for the duration of the meeting. We will begin with the invocation by Mr. Doug Tremblay, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings that you have given us, including this wonderful day. Please continue to watch over all of us, especially those in any sort of need. We ask that you watch over and protect those who unselfishly serve to protect us, whether they are here or abroad. We also ask that you guide us in wisdom and courage to best serve our citizens. In your name we pray. pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mrs. Snead? Here. Mr. Tremblay? Here. Mr. Kendall? Here. Mr. Heath? Here. Mr. Swayzer? Here. Mrs. Oda? Here. Mr. Phillips? Here. Mr. Twist? Here. Mr. Twilliger? I move we excuse Mr. Twilliger. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kendall and seconded by Mr. Tremblay to excuse Mr. Terwilliger. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Here. I'm yes. Mr. Twist? Sorry. Yes. Mrs. Snead? Yes. Mr. Twilliger is excused. Tonight we have a couple of presentations, and we will begin with a presentation from Mr. Joseph Braden of the Officer of Office of the Auditor of the State of Ohio, um, Mr. Braden, and Mr. Friggy, Would you please um, go down and accept? All right. Well, it's it's great to be here tonight. It's my <coughs> honor to be here on behalf of Auditor State Dave Yost. To present the City of Troy here, the Auditor State Award with distinction for the audit period of 2015 year. It's important to note that this puts the City of Troy in a very select group. The Auditor State Office audits nearly 6,000 entities and less than 300 are eligible for this award. To receive this award, I'll tell you what it takes to get it here. Here we go. Uh, you must Complete a comprehensive annual financial report within six months of fiscal year end. Have a clean audit with no findings for recovery, no material citations, no material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, single audit findings, or question cost. Have no other financial concerns, and the management letter contains no comments related to ethics referrals, questions costs less than $10,000, lack of timely report submission, reconciliation issues, failure to obtain a timely single audit, findings for recovery, or public meetings or public records issues. This award represents all the hard work of every city employee who strives each day to achieve accounting excellence. I also want to recognize the mayor and all the elected council members for their outstanding effort and excellent job for accounting for the every city dollar. I especially want to recognize and step on up here, Mr. Free, the city auditor, for his outstanding leadership, professionalism, and commitment to fiscal integrity. Job well done, John. Um, on behalf of Auditor State Dave Yost, I would like to present the Auditor of State Award with distinction to Mr. Free and the City of Troy. Thank you very much, Mr. Braden, and congratulations, Mr. Friggy. Our next presentation is from Mayor Beamish with a proclamation for the Feed Ohio to be presented to Ethan Gale and Richard Steinemann this evening. If you gentlemen would like to come forward, please. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming forward. As uh, President Baker indicated that September is Feed Ohio Month, and uh, I will just say that in City Hall we do have a barrel for people that would like to donate uh, to help uh, minister to those who go hungry. 
And these two individuals, as we all know, are two individuals that care deeply about individuals within our community and surrounding. So this proclamation, I'm not going to read every whereas, but uh, I would read uh, a number of them. <clears throat> whereas hunger is an issue that is widespread and great concern that transcends geographic and faith boundaries and must therefore be addressed with efforts in every part of our state. And whereas Ohio faith-based and community service organizations and businesses join together with the governor to organize and execute a statewide effort in September of 2016 to raise money, collect food products for food charities throughout the state. And whereas the city of Troy continues to support those in need through community food pantries and soup kitchens. Now therefore I, Michael L. Beamish, Mayor of the City of Troy, Ohio, by virtue of the authority that is vested in me, do hereby proclaim September 1st through September 30th of 2016 as Feed Ohio Month in the City of Troy, Ohio. And I would recognize Feed Ohio to be that worthy faith-based statewide initiative and I would encourage all of us to get involved by volunteering their communities to give so that they can help all individuals and families that do struggle with hunger issues. And sealed and signed, I'd like to present that to both of you. I don't know which one will take it with you, but thank you for your continued support in all the community and through the state of Ohio, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Beamish. We have now two public hearings. I'll ask Mrs. Knight to read Ordinance 042-2016. Ordinance 042-2016, changing the zoning of N lot 7504 in the city of Troy, Ohio, from the zoning of M2 Light Industrial District to B2 General Business District. This is the address of 2569 West Main Street. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this ordinance? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak against the ordinance? Okay, I declare this public hearing closed. Um, the second one this evening is Ordinance 043-2016. Mrs. Knight, would you please read that? Ordinance 043-2016, ordinance changing the zoning of part of N-Lot 9891 in the city of Troy, Ohio, from the zoning of AR, Agricultural Residential District, and R1, Single Family Residential District, to the single zoning classification of R1, Single Family Residential District. This is part of the Halifax development. I declare this public hearing open. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this ordinance? Is there anyone who wishes to speak against the ordinance? I'll declare this public hearing closed. Mrs. Knight, please read a summary of the minutes of the August 15th meeting of Troy City Council. <coughs> minutes of Council, August 15, 2016, committee reports. The Finance Committee recommended legislation be prepared to provide for the Smithfly Designs LLC loan uh, to, to it, for Smithfly Designs LLC to assume the loan made to Charles Sturwold. Law and Ordinance Committee recommended that legislation be prepared authorizing an agreement with Troy Main Street for the 2016 Taste of Troy event. Committee recommended 034-2016, a rezoning of part of Outlots 119 and 120 be adopted. Personnel Committee reported regarding reappointments to the city beautification and all the reappointments were approved by council. Streets and Sidewalks Committee recommended that legislation be prepared <coughs> providing approval for ODOT consent to pave portions of State Route 41. Resolution number R33 2016, cooperation with ODOT for resurfacing of State Route 41 East and State Route 41 West where it touches the city of Troy city limits, first reading and adopted. R34 2016, 
approving the application of Smith Fly Designs to assume a loan uh, from that had been made to Charles Sterling, <coughs> first reading and adopted. Ordinance number 034, 2016, a rezoning part of Outlaws 119 and 120 was given third reading and was adopted. Ordinance number 041, 2016, authorizing an agreement with Troy Main Street related to the Taste of Troy event for 2016 was given first reading and was adopted. Ordinance 042, 2016, a rezoning for a parcel at 2569 West Main was given first reading. Ordinance 043, 2016, rezoning of a parcel of uh, N lot 9891, part of the Halifax subdivision, was given first reading. Following various comments, council adjourned at 7.25 p.m. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? I have one. Mrs. Oda? Um, Mr. Oda should be Mrs. Oda. <laughs> Just at the very end of the minutes. Okay, all right, thank you. Not a big deal to me, but. I believe we accept the minutes as read. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kendall and seconded by Mr. Phillips to accept the minutes as corrected. Uh, Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Kendall. Yes. Mr. Heath. Yes. Mr. Swayzer. Yes. Mrs. Oda. Yes. Mr. Phillips. Yes. Mr. Twiss. Yes. Mrs. Sneed. Yes. Mr. Trembley. Yes. Minutes are approved. We'll move on then to committee reports and begin with the Community and Economic Development Committee. And Chairman, Mr. William Twiss. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, committee members Schwazer and Twiss met on August 31st. Following the provisions of state law on August 24th, the city was notified that an expedited Type 2 annexation petition was filed with the county for the annexation of 55.8 acres in Concord Township to the city of Troy. This land is located east and north of Lytle Road based on the state law section under which this annexation petition was filed and qualifies there is a very short timeline for council to consider three separate pieces of legislation addressing what services the municipal corporation would provide to any parcel within the city including the proposed for annexation a statement of buffering requirements and legislation consenting or objecting to the annexation based on the timeline discussed in the detailed report legislative action must be considered at tonight's meeting it is the recommendation of this committee that legislation be prepared approving the three legislative items required by state law related to the first Troy Corp annexation of 55.8 acres from Concord Township to meet the timeline of a state law for an expedited annexation. We understand that legislation will be, will be submitted as an emergency measure and that is respectfully submitted by Tom Kendall, John Swayzer, and myself as Chair William Twist. Are there any questions from Council? Thank you, Mr. Twiss. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Schwazer, would you please present the liquor license stock, ex stock change notice? Yes, Madam President. The Ohio Division of Liquor Control has transmitted the <coughs> notice of an application of, uh, for change of corporate stock ownership related to the existing C1, C2, and D6 applications held by Walgreen Company uh, for 20 West Market Street. The police, is, the police department has advised that there is no basis for objection to the application. Thank you. The next report is from the Streets and Sidewalks Committee and Chairman, Mr. Bobby Phillips. Thank you, ma'am. On 31, August 31, this committee met to consider supporting the designation of U.S. Bicycle Route 25 within the City of Troy. The City of Troy, as well as communities throughout Ohio, have been working with Bike Ohio to request the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and the Ohio Department of Transportation to designate a series of, exi of existing bike corridors crossing Ohio to be developed as U.S. bike bicycle routes to connect the routes and communities. That effort has been successful with the bike path through Troy to be known as U.S. Bicycle Route 25. There is no initial cost to the city for signs that will be placed along the paths and no additional construction is required. The recommendation of the committee it is the recommendation of this committee that legislation be prepared requesting that AASHTO and ODOT officially designate U.S. Bike Route 25 as a U.S. Bicycle Route. 
Based on ODOT's requested response date of September 30, we do support emergency legislation. And I might add that this is, has nothing to do with County Road 25A. It just happens to parallel it in some areas. And this is respectfully submitted by uh, Councilman Heath, Councilwoman Snee, and myself as chair. Are there any questions from Council? Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, we now have a report from the Safety and Health Committee and Chairperson Mrs. Robin Oda. Thank you, Madam President. This committee met on August 16th regarding the required routine updating of the emergency operations plan. The basic document is unchanged from the previously approved plan. Changes primarily reflect any updates to names and contact information. It is the recommendation of this committee that legislation be prepared to approve the emergency operations plan. Respectfully submitted, Mr. Heath, Mr. Twilliger, and myself as chair. Are there any questions from council? <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. Zoda. Uh, chairman, Mr. Tremblay has two reports from the Utilities Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> this committee met on August 15th to consider the dedication of a storm sewer drainage easement at 400 Trade Square East. A storm sewer needs to be rerouted to accommodate an addition at the Hobart Institute of Welding Technology, and the easement is required to reflect the new location. There is no cost to the city. It is the recommendation of this committee that legislation be prepared approving the dedication of a storm sewer drainage easement related to the work at the Hobart Institute of Welding Technology. As the project is currently taking place, we support emergency legislation so there is no delay and that is uh, respectfully submitted by Mr. Terwilliger, Mr. Twist, and myself as chair. Are there any questions from council? You may continue, Mr. Tremblay. Uh, thank you. Um, the Utilities Committee met on August 15th regarding a new three-year opt-out electric aggregation agreement with First Energy Solutions Corporation, effective May of 2017. The new agreement will permit residents and small businesses that have not opted out of the program to continue to realize savings over the term of the agreement. Following a process of soliciting vendors for the new three-year period, the city's consultant and staff recommended a new opt-out agreement with First Energy Solutions Corporation as the company that will continue to provide participants with the greatest savings. Those savings are discussed in a detailed report as uh, as the method by which the consultant is compensated. It is the recommendation <coughs> of this committee that legislation be prepared authorizing the Director of Public Service and Safety to enter into a three-year opt-out electric generation agreement with First Energy Solutions Corporation commencing May 2017. And that is respectfully submitted by Mr. Terwilliger, Mr. Twist, and myself as chair. Do any members of council have questions? I, I have one question. Mrs. Zoda? Um, Mr. Titterington, do, if we already have that, if we're already enrolled in that, do we have to re-enroll, or does it just roll over? It'll just roll over. You don't have to do anything. And do new people in Troy have to call to get that savings? There will be a new notification that will go out, so they will have the opportunity to, to get in. But like right now? Uh, they can always... Get how into how it, do they yes. know about it? Uh, we do have a, uh, a, a phone number that they can call. I believe the link is on our website. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Tremblay. You're welcome. Are there any other committee reports be to come before council this evening? We now open the meeting to citizen comments. There is a two-minute time limit at this point in the meeting, and Mr. Kerber is our timekeeper. Does anyone in the audience have any questions or comments related to the agenda items this evening? If so, please come to the microphone and state your name and address before addressing council. Buster Connor, 1210 South Place Street, Troy, Ohio. And as I'm only going by what I read in the paper, but when you had your uh, committee meeting on uh, the property out at Lido Road, evidently one of the council people at that time asked Mr. Titherton if he was going to uh, get in contact or notify the people in the area what was going on. 
And he stated in the, in the paper there that he said it's not our responsibility, it's up to the citizens to contact us. And I'm thinking, well, how would the citizens contact you if they don't know anything about what's going on? I mean, it's... <laughs> um, I think maybe there's a point of clarification here. Mr. Titterington, would Thank you like you, to Madam clarify? President. No, um, the process as an expedited annexation requires the property owner the petitioner to notify those property owners. Does, we're not requiring the, the adjacent property owners to call us. I agree with you, that would not make a lot of sense. Then do you follow up to see if that person has contacted the citizens around his area? Uh, I believe that that is part of the process that the county verifies. Uh, and it may, they may have to reject the annexation petition if it's not followed. But that would be a county. Because I know, you know, it's emergency legislation, and once it's uh, passed, you know, the, the citizens have no recourse on anything after it's emergency legislation. Well, the the city is not the final word on the annexation. The county okay. actually does. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience have any comments at this point? We'll move on to resolutions then and ask Mrs. Knight to read resolution R35, 2016. Resolution number R35, 2016. Resolution authorizing the Director of Public Service and Safety to enter into a governmental opt-out electric power aggregation agreement with First Energy Solutions Corporation of Akron, Ohio. This will be a new three-year agreement that takes effect May of 2017, first reading. Are there any questions or comments from Council? I move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Tremblay and seconded by Mr. Twiss to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twiss? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Move for adoption. Second. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kendall and seconded by Mr. Heath. To adopt the resolution, Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twiss? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Resolution is adopted. Mrs. Knight, please read resolution R36, 2016. Resolution number R36, 2016. Resolution establishing municipal services for certain territory containing 55.800 acres, more or less, in Concord Township in the city of Troy, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. This is the first Troy Corp annexation, and this is the first reading. Are there any comments or questions from Council? Move this second. It's been moved by Mr. Schweizer and seconded by Mr. Twiss. To suspend the rules, Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twiss? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Schweizer and seconded by Mr. Twiss to adopt the resolution. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Phillips? <coughs> Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Resolution is adopted. Mrs. Knight, please read resolution R37, 2016. Resolution number R37, 2016. Resolution establishing buffer requirements for certain territory containing 55.800 acres more or less at Concord Township in the city of Troy, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. This is also for the first Troy Corp annexation, first reading. Any comments from Council? I have a question. Mrs. Zoda? Patrick, what are, what are buffering requirements when there's just an annexation? And I didn't think about this during the committee meeting, but what buffering requirements are there for an annexation? Okay, they're, they're a, a very narrow circumstances where that might happen, where there's completely incompatible uh, uses. We have very similar requirements in our zoning code. It's not something that would come into effect unless, number one, we do deem it incompatible, number two, 
that there is a development plan and as part of that development plan then we would require such bu uh, buffering requirements okay. so could be a fence could be um, a hedgerow it could be landscaping there's a variety of different so that's buffers. just in case they take it just beyond annexation okay thank that's you that's great any other questions I move to suspend the rules second it's been moved by Mr. Tremblay and seconded by Mr. Heath to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Twiss? Yes. Mrs. Steed? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Moved to adopt. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Swayzer and seconded by Mr. Twiss to adopt the resolution. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Resolution is adopted. Mrs. Knight, please read resolution R38-2016. Resolution number R38-2016, resolution consenting to the annexation of certain territory containing 55.800 acres, more or less, in Concord Township to the city of Troy, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. Uh, this is also for the first Troy Corp annexation and the first reading. Are there any comments from council? Move to suspend. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Oda and seconded by Mrs. Snee to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Sneak. Yes. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Snee and seconded by Mr. Schwazer to adopt the resolution. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Schwazer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Resolution is adopted. Mrs. Knight, please read resolution R39 2016. Resolution number R39, 2016. Resolution authorizing the City of Troy, Ohio to designate U.S. Bicycle Route 25 in cooperation with the Ohio Department of Transportation and declaring an emergency. This uh, is an emergency as ODOT has requested return of the approving legislation by September 30th, first reading. Are there any questions from Council? Move for suspension. Second. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kendall and seconded by Mrs. Snee to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Move for adoption. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kendall and seconded by Mr. Heath to adopt the resolution. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Resolution is adopted. We'll move on to ordinances and ask Mrs. Knight to please read Ordinance 042 2016. Ordinance 042 2016. Ordinance changing the zoning of in lot 7504, parcel D08101146, in the city of Troy, Ohio, from the zoning of M2 Light Industrial District to B2 General Business District. This has been recommended for approval by the Troy Planning Commission. A public hearing was held this evening, and a committee meeting will be established. Second reading. This will now go to the Community and Economic Development Committee, and uh, they will be setting a meeting shortly. Mrs. Knight, please read Ordinance 043-2016. Ordinance number 043-2016. Ordinance changing the zoning of part up in lot 9891, parcel D4500-2549. In the city of Troy, Ohio, from the zoning of AR, Agricultural Residential District, and R1, Single Family Residential District, to the single zoning classification of R1, Single Family Residential District. This is part of the Halifax subdivision. The rezoning has been recommended for approval by the Troy Planning Commission. A public hearing was held this evening and a committee meeting will be set. Second reading. And this also then goes to the Community and Economic Development Committee. 
Mrs. Knight, please read Ordinance 044, 2016. Ordinance number 044, 2016. Ordinance adopting the City of Troy, Ohio Emergency Operations Plan. This will be approval of the 2016 edition, which is mainly uh, updating contact and name information. This is the first reading. Are there any questions from Council? Move to adopt. Second. I mean, move to suspend. Thank you. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Oda and seconded by Mr. Tremblay to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Swayzer and seconded by Mr. Twist to adopt the ordinance. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. And Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ordinance is adopted. Mrs. Knight, please read the final ordinance of the evening, 045-2016. Ordinance number 045-2016. Ordinance fading, vacating a stormwater drainage line easement and dedicating a stormwater drainage line easement for the Hobart Institute of Welding Technology in declaring an emergency. This is slightly moving the location of the storm drain. This uh, is the first reading and it's requested to be an emergency as the construction project is ongoing, first reading. Any questions from council? Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Tremblay and seconded by Mrs. Snee to suspend the rules. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mr. Twist? Yes. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. We will adopt. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Swayzer and seconded by Mr. Kendall to adopt the ordinance. Mrs. Knight, please call the roll. Mrs. Snee? Yes. Mr. Tremblay? Yes. Mr. Kendall? Yes. Mr. Heath? Yes. Mr. Swayzer? Yes. Mrs. Oda? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Twist? Yes. Ordinance is adopted. That completes the business portion of tonight's meeting. Mrs. Knight, are there any communications or announcements? No, they're not. Uh, tonight we have a presentation from the Troy Community Works uh, president, Mr. Richard Dinsmore, and the architect, Mr. Mike Dingledine. Um, I believe you have a PowerPoint that you wanted to present, so uh, council will please kind of move over a little bit. We'll put the screen down here, but I guess. Mrs. Baker, if I could just kind of set this up a little bit. A, just to, to remind council, about a year ago, uh, Troy Community Works awarded a forgivable loan for the uh, Coleman Allen Salomon building, which is on the northeast corner of the public square. And while it looks like it's been sitting there for a year with not a lot going on, I can assure you that there's been a lot of work behind the scenes um, that have been in the process of making this, this building a, uh, a landmark again in the community. Um, right after we purchased the building, we had to do some emergency repairs to the building to make it secure for the winter. Um, we also have kept the building leased. Uh, during the time period while we've been doing development work, which is a bit of a challenge because we need to be able to vacate that building once we start the process. During the process of, of going through the RFP for the architects, we had submitted over, um, there were 30 architects that had permitted, uh, submitted uh, proposals. Um, we received 12 quotes from 12 different architects. We selected um, Mike Dingledine and CDA Group out of Hamilton because of their experience in doing this kind of rehabilitation work. And one of the key things that came out of this process was that we learned that we are eligible for historic tax credits as it relates to this building. So this will add, at some point, if we qualify and we actually receive the tax credits, we could receive over a million dollars to help support the, the revitalization of this building. So what Mike's going to take you through tonight is a little bit of the study that went on in terms of where we are with this building and what our next steps are in terms of the plans. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike and let him take you through the plans. Thanks, Rich. Good evening. Happy to be here uh, to share kind of uh, what we've learned about this building and a little bit about what we're doing in Hamilton, Ohio, which is another great Miami River town, uh, very similar to Troy. Uh, and we've had some recent success with downtown revitalization. So. 
Um, that was part of the connection that was made uh, between our firm and, and your group, uh, Detroit Community Works. Uh, so Hamilton, since about uh, the beginning of 2013, has created an organization called the Hamilton Core Fund. It was built around the same successes that Cincinnati used uh, for 3CDC, and it is a nonprofit revitalization agency. And we've been trying to reset buildings in downtown Hamilton that have been empty or underused for a long, long time. Um, and so we have did a lot of study with 3CDC. We've done some study now with you guys and some other cities like Middletown and Springfield. Um, and we are learning some things about what downtown revitalization is looking like and how we're getting to the place we are tonight uh, with your building. Uh, there's three really important trends that we've sort of identified. Uh, the first is that urban fabric and urban re renaissance is happening. People want to live in urban environments again. And in fact, um, one third of the population today is living in urban environments. We think in the next five years that's going to hit a 50-50 mark where as many people are living in urban cities as are living in suburban uh, areas. Uh, and that's a huge shift since, um, probably since before World War II, since that has happened. Uh, the other thing that, especially the river towns of the Great Miami River, are there's a fabulous quality of built in urban fabric. Um, cities that were built by the industrial wealth that was created from the power and the naviga navigation of the river uh, really left us with a great sort of fabric of buildings. That, that we think of that wealth as having left most of our towns. Certainly Hamilton's industrial wealth has left. The paper mills are closed, the steel mills are closed. But the fabric that was left behind by all of that wealth is still extant and still important and still in a place where we can leverage. And certainly Troy is no exception to that. Uh, just a fabulous collection of buildings, architecture, urban fabric. And then the final thing is us, uh, finally we're embracing public-private partnership. We were believed things all had to be the private sector when it came to real estate and buildings or they had to be all public and now we're seeing uh, the public sharing uh, and evidence right here tonight where th this community has partnered with a nonprofit agency to start working in partnership on a project. And so um, we have seen that success in Hamilton. This was our first project. It was more of a learning ex example for us than it was a uh, core fund project because this, exactly, uh, this actually occurred before the core fund. But what we learned from this project really directed us to what we were, how we were going to be able to succeed in downtown revitalization. So in 2009, 2010, uh, this building was completely empty. Um, we were looking for new office space downtown. Um, there were some discussions about applying for historic tax credits in our downtown. Uh, the space where our office is now, the roof had relocated to the basement. Um, and this building was uh, just about to be issued a demolition permit in the middle of our, our 200 block of downtown Hamilton, right in the heart of downtown Hamilton. And so a few historic preservationists said, let's look for people, let's look for resources, let's look for tools in the toolbox that allow us to figure out ways that if we can save this, that we would save it. And so we did that. And today, this is our office. It's in that same space that you saw the roof gone from. Uh, historic tax credits were a major tool in the toolbox of this project. Uh, we found old pictures of its uh, heyday as a department store. Um, you know, in the last 40 years, it's been nothing but empty storage or empty storefronts. And so uh, as we pulled it apart, we realized that a lot of the value of that building was still hidden underneath the dirt and the dust. Uh, and we were able, again, through the use of historic tax credits, to justify the redevelopment pro forma of this building. Uh, 29 lit uh, market rate apartments and three uh, very important storefronts. Again, off the charts qualities that you never think of when you think of these old buildings. Nine foot high windows, uh, you know, huge ceilings, the ability to do, uh, again, the demand now in cities to do higher end rental apartments and the ability to rent these. And so. The banks told us this is a great project, good luck, but we're not renting any, we're not loaning you any money until there is a stabilized rent structure. But we were, we were full within six months of opening this building, um, as well as having all of our storefronts um, <coughs> occupied. So it was a great success. It was more of on the private side. Um, the historic developers were the owners and developers of this project. There were lots of public partnerships. There were lots of facade easements. There were historic tax credits. There were loans by our community foundation to make this project happen. So our community foundation board said, we want to figure out a way to formalize this. We want to figure out a way what tools help us do these kinds of projects. And what we learned is there is no silver bullet. There is no one tool that you can use across all kinds of projects and buildings. You really need to fill your toolbox with anything that you can find. And so there, some of these don't come into play very often in our projects, but every project has used one of these tools or a, or a collection of these tools uh, as we've done downtown revitalization. So our takeaway and our, what we would share with any city is that you need to fill your toolbox with opportunities to help projects along because they don't meet, they don't connect. 
And so our core fund is doing four things in Hamilton, and so is your community works uh, program here. We're being intentional. We're picking buildings because we want to make sure we can reset them. We have access to patient capital uh, in that we have partnerships with banks and the community foundation. Uh, we want to use public-private leverage. <coughs> right now, we were hoping at the start of the core fund to be $1 of public for every $3 of private. Right now, we're sitting around 1 to 6 in that relationship, so it's working very well. And most importantly, you have to control the real estate. A well-intentioned building owner who doesn't have the resources or the tools to do something about a building can't do, can't do what we're doing. So you need site control. That's the most important thing. So getting control of that building and giving uh, Troy Community Works a forgivable loan, that was site control. That was the very first most important step. So this is where we're challenged. This is what we call the revitalization gap. I used to think that owners were lazy or unwilling or didn't have vision. And what I realized as I got into this with the banks is there is no way that the money you put into a building will come out of the building in, in the fact of where the current economics are. We have to change something in that equation. We have to stretch all of those rubber bands to the center to get this to work. And so we're working on all those things on the right, and we're over-investing in the cost of revitalization, hoping that pretty soon we will, re we will get a break-even point in where revitalization happens. And so this pr first project may not be a, a one-to-one ROI break-even point, but it will eventually cause you to reach this point. And we believe that re really deep down, and we've seen it in Hamilton happen. So we would invest more money in a building than we could get out of it, but what we saw was an indirect ROI that was huge. We opened new businesses, we had new residents downtown, and buildings that were empty and for sale for five, six, seven years with no offers, zero offers, uh, sold weeks after we opened some of these neighboring buildings. And so we had a, a, a multiplier effect in our ROI in Hamilton uh, and have new businesses now to show for that. It had nothing to do with our resources or our funds. So this block of Hamilton is probably the best architectural example of, of downtown Hamilton. Um, this is a, in its heyday, about 1920. Uh, in 2009, it was 2% 2 occupied, 220,000 square feet of this block. That's all floors, all levels. Uh, 2,000 square feet was occupied. Today, in 2016, it is 100% occupied. Every square foot of every building is occupied. And it's a little building. It's a big building. It's a medium-sized building. It's a private project, it's a public project, it's an orchestration of everybody's resources. So that's what my hope is for here, and I'm seeing it in terms of the way you've set up this first project. So our core fund is, is succeeding, and it's really a, a, an, a, an absolute same version of what Troy Community Works is trying to be here. So getting to this building uh, was exciting for us because it was an excellent piece of architecture. It's on a beautiful square. The downtown fabric is already great and we think there's a lot that can be done to bring this building back. Uh, so the first thing we did was to just d delve into it, delve into its neighbors, delve into the fabric, and again, it's great here. It's, it's astounding here, exactly. You have wonderful building stock, you have wonderful buildings, uh, and a great street system, uh, and a great little town, and it's, again, Miami River Town's just like Hamilton. Uh, I think we all have that ability. We have this massive $300 million shopping center out at the end of the highway on I-75, <coughs> that spent $300 million trying to be what Troy and Hamilton already are. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a weak example of, of the architecture, uh, but it's proof that this is what is drawing people, even in a retail market today. So, and you've got it right here. So you've got some proof of concept. There was an early project, a small project that they've done. That's some example of success and some example of the process and it's some example of the tools. Uh, but we completely measured, surveyed, broke apart, dug into the trusses, dug into the basements, and sort of got the understanding of where this building is uh, for the basic purposes of launching in, into some of these tools, especially historic tax credits, which are one of the most effective tools in our arsenal of, of how to look at these buildings. So we documented the existing condition of the entire building. We measured it. We looked at the structure. We looked at the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems. Uh, we looked at how we might modify it. Uh, and we documented the entire project for you. So that, that part is done. Uh, at that point, uh, we um, looked at the physical facility, the structure, the condition of the roof, uh, the condition of pieces and parts. Um, there is a lot of deferred maintenance in this building, but it is not out of control. It has not gotten to the demolition by neglect phase. And so, frankly, there's work to do on this building, but it fits in the scale of this building's sort of ability to generate some income for itself to sort of service its own debt. So we see there's a lot of work to do with this building, uh, but it is not at the point where we can't catch it. Uh, with the right youth re revitalization and the right reuse of the building. Uh, and so the close-up uh, images are, you know, concerning, uh, but they aren't at a point where we have lost this building, which is great. 
Uh, some minor structural issues, but again, our structural engineers have assured us it's all uh, eminently repairable in terms of where we are. Uh, lots of historic changes to the building that we have to track and map. Uh, here's some evidence of old windows that we're in. We have to decide how to reuse those or not to reuse those. Uh, inside is where it gets even more exciting. Very high windows, very nice details of trim, nice flooring. Um, all of the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems have been applied to the surfaces of this building since uh, its, its original uh, concept. So it's going to be easy to get out of the way and get rid of and start over. Um, it's actually not a negative, it's a positive. Uh, so we're seeing this building as sort of a, a ground zero from the mechanical, plumbing, electrical standpoint, but a very, very solid building from a structural standpoint and the finishes uh, and scale of the rooms, uh, just wonderful spaces in this building. So to get it back and to understand the best use, and we call it the highest and best use, what, does, what is the highest and best use? It's the, high, the use that allows us to generate enough income to service the structure of the debt that it's going to take to revitalize it. It's that break-even point. Um, the building has a nice vertical circulation core that allows us to go up and down in the building without having to go through the other spaces on the ground floor. So we could mix the use. We can have retail on the first floor, residential on the upper floors. Uh, and we actually looked at five different design options as we studied the building, uh, where we had the main floor ostensibly the same commercial space that it is now with all the upper floors being residential. We looked at all the floors being commercial retail. We looked at just doing the exterior uh, redevelopment, but leaving the entire interior dark shell. Uh, we looked at the first two floors being commercial with a third floor residential. And then finally, we added an, a fifth alternative that actually broke up the first floor retail into a totally different design into much smaller units. So we've studied all of these and we've costed all of these to try to compare them to the tools that might be available uh, to make, make this building go. So the total building, looking at our final options, 13,900 square feet, uh, pretty good size. Although in the world of tax credits, it's in the small, medium size. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, square footage to work with here to generate income. Um, and so our option A looked at leaving the retail space the way it is today, although creating some back of house, new restrooms, new uh, common lobby, a new elevator to access the upper floors, uh, but leaving the uh, retail the way it is sort of post-50s. Uh, it's sort of the Art Deco look, the shoe stores in the recent past. The upper floors, they would all turn into uh, open studios. Again, these size studios, five, six, seven hundred square feet, are really marketable. Uh, there's a strong market for them in, in our city and in your city and other small river town cities here, we've noticed. And then the upper floor being more high end, being a larger um, sort of empty nester, uh, baby boomer type of apartment, but again, a higher end uh, with much more amenities than the studio apartments. So we've taken all that and then we've re-looked at the first floor at the, at the request of your board, your community works board, and we've come up with much smaller pocket sort of retail spaces. Again, uh, generates a lot more income, creates the ability to have all different kinds of stores and retails, creates back of house support for all of them. None of them have to have their own restrooms or their own garbage room or their own mechanical room. All that's taken care of in a common space and then the retail spaces are much smaller. And so we go back to the openings that were original to the building. Uh, we op open up, get rid of the, the large overhang that was put on in the 50s, get rid of the, the shingles that never really went with the architecture of the building, and really go back to an earlier stage of the building. And the State Historic Preservation Office says this is probably the significant period in this building's history, and this is where we should be going from the standpoint of its use. So this is kind of a rendering of the building in that sort of reuse. Uh, the, you'll notice the red brick color of the building isn't exactly the actual brick though. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office uh, says the br brick of this age is very fragile and very soft and we should be painting it, but they have no objection to us painting it a color uh, that matches its original brick color. So this is a painted version, uh, but it does give us a lot more um, distinction to the, the wonderful trim work that has been black and sort of um, melded together for the longest time in the building with white paint and the black trim. So the trim pops better, uh, this, this is much more historic in terms of the way the building was, and then we can identify through um, the new storefronts um, the, all those little retail spaces that are going to be on the square. So we feel like this is a really usable, really um, marketable way to create this building, and our pro formas actually show us able to create enough income with this building to service the debt if we can leverage that debt with some tools. Um, and so those tools are um, historic tax credits in this case. And so what they base your credits on is what are your total qualified development expenditures. And each of our options had a total. Uh, and we look at the bottom, design option E, the $2.3 million project, uh, is the project that we could 
we could show the qualified development estimate at that number. That includes the outside restoration, includes new storefronts, includes the entire interior build out, which is retail and residential, and includes soft costs that we're allowed to collect and then recycle back into the project. So we've been very careful to look at that. And so here's what we get with that 2.3 million. We can apply for 20% federal and 25% state tax credits. That's about, as Rich said, about a little over a million dollars in, in tax credits that help this project make sense in the pro forma. Uh, it's a competitive program. In fact, it's gotten very competitive in the last few years. Uh, but they have two rounds a year and there's no uh, sign. There was a, a little blip on the radar of this program going away. Uh, but the, um, the proponents of this program prevailed at the state level to keep it going. And so this is round 16 that we're in today. And we're looking for about 80 points to be kind of in the top tier of the credit, credit release. So that's going to be difficult, but something we can focus on. We have to be income producing, so this has to be rental for a period of time. Uh, we have to be certified historic, which that process is already underway with the National Park Service. We have to build to the Secretary of the Interior standards. They're prescriptive, they're uh, pretty stiff, but they are, they are achievable, and especially with this particular building. And then we have to wait on this work until after we are awarded tax credits. So for anybody that's, that's impatient and wonders why the building sits without a lot of new work, it's that everything we spend before the tax credits does not get the credit uh, applied. Everything we do after the credit award then applies to that uh, qualified expenditures. So it's very important that we stabilize the building but then stop and wait for this process to play out. So um, this is the schedule for round 16. Uh, we did everything through the August 29th application. Last week, our historic part one and two application went into the state. Uh, we have a month to do some revisions if they have any questions or any um, concerns. And then we will find out by the end of the year whether we have been awarded tax credits in round 16. And if we haven't been, we can go to round 17 that's due in March of 2017. So the art space project in Hamilton went, went three rounds before it was awarded its credits. Um, that's not unusual. Uh, although we might have an opportunity to do, do it sooner. So our schedule really reflects the past year. Uh, heavily, we got involved in April, uh, but through December, showing how we would get through this award. And then because the state requires us to understand the longest possible window for those credits to be used, we show a 24-month construction period. But I'm here to tell you we can probably achieve that in about 15 months. Um, but the state wants to see the longest window possible to allow those credits to be spent. Um, so we're looking at about a two-year process at the outside, maybe a 15-month process um, in the most optimistic terms uh, to get this project done after the first of the year. So I'll answer any questions you have. Um, I'll let you finish your meeting. Right. Yes, sir. When the building was original, it did not have that mansard roof on it. That's, that's correct. When was that added? Well, we, uh, I don't know the exact date, but it obviously it was after the 1900s. And so there were three major changes to that building. I think the, 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 the Allen change, the middle change, was the one in the early 1900s that added the mansard. And also included one more bay of building uh, to, the, to, the west, to the east. And so that's been uh, separated from this building as well. Uh, but the state thinks that the mansard is significant enough to, to not go back to what it was before that. So that, that mansard goes you know, back pre-1900 or around 1900, um, and certainly shows up in the pictures we see of the building. Any questions? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this um, presentation available either in print or um, and Certainly. A there's a PDF and there's the entire study booklet, which is about 220 pages uh, that uh, Tory Community Works, they have them. I know Greg has copies and okay. I'll make sure he has a copy of this presentation as well. All right. Just so in case any council members want to come in Absolutely. and get it or anybody else in the community for that matter. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your very time. Much.
Mayor Beamish, do you have any comments this evening? Just that uh, Saturday, September 10th, is going to be another very active day in the city of Troy. They have the Alzheimer's Walk, and we got the Taste of Troy. Lowe's has a safety program uh, going, um, second story tours, and then uh, the Troy High School Band concert's going on. So there'll be a lot of traffic around Troy on Saturday. That's it, just to make everybody aware. Mr. Titterington, any comments this evening? Uh, in keeping with uh, dates, uh, Trick or Treat will be on October 31st. It will be on that date. We don't anticipate any schedule changes, uh, but uh, it will be from 6 to 8 p.m. as usual. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Kerber, do you have any comments this evening? No, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Friggy, any comments this evening? I have nothing at this time. Thank you, Madam President. Okay. Thank you. Any com comments from Council this evening? Madam President. Mr. Phillips. Just a note to Mrs. Knight and to yourself that I'll be out of state all next week. Okay. Anyone else? Are there any comments from city staff this evening? Anyone in the audience have any comments or questions? Down to South Place Street, Troy, Ohio. This will be uh, addressed to the mayor. He had an article, I guess, in the paper there about uh, medical marijuana. He didn't want it in the town. He didn't think it was fit for this town. But uh, I don't take everything he says as chiseled in stone because he used to be a Democrat and he said, if you want to get elected as mayor, you've got to change party. So he changed. Then he was against uh, alcohol in Troy, and a lady put an interview in the paper against uh, what the mayor had done and said he ought to get back to the way he was, but uh, I guess when money comes involved, he will change his mind again. So, like I said, he's not chiseled in stone what he does say, so he may change his mind again. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from anyone in the audience? Uh, we do appreciate your presentation tonight uh, from Troy Community Works. Very interesting and educational for us. Thank you all for attending tonight's meeting. Have a safe and peace-filled week. Meeting adjourned.